Some people say that college will be the best years of your life. So much growth happens during this time. You move out of your family home for the first time. You start taking more specific classes towards the career you've jumped of for years. You meet new friends and you test your newly found independence. Many people look fondly on their college years, that special few years where you have a taste of adult responsibility while still being able to party and have fun with friends all the time. For Reagan Tokes, her life was just getting started. She was at her dream university, she had an amazing group of friends, and she was so excited to start in her new career. However, those dreams would be brutally ripped away from her violently and for absolutely no reason. But before we get into today's case, I want to say a huge thank you to Huge Casino for partnering with me on today's video. I am someone who loves a good Vegas trip, but of course, I don't often have the time or money to do that. But with Huge Casino, I get to play those thrilling slot games with that Vegas feel alongside friends. With Huge Casino, you get to play over 100 online casino games from retro classics to modern slot machines inspired by real slots. But that's not all. On top of slots, you can also play poker, roulette, baccarat, and blackjack. As you play, you can place bets to earn more chips, and the more you play, the more you level up. And as you earn more, you unlock even more games and slots to play. I am a creature of habit, and I've always loved to play the Buffalo game at the casino, so of course, I love to bet on the Buffalo slots on Huge Casino. I am also working to unlock another slot that caught my eye immediately called Cuteness Overload. It shows a picture of little dogs, which gets me so excited and so happy. I love dogs, and I love puppies. Also, on Huge Casino, you can join a club to play with friends and compete in the Billionaire League. Huge Casino is free to download on iOS and Android. Now, the game does not offer real money for gambling or opportunity to win real prizes. It's just for fun and to relax while immersing yourself in the Vegas experience. So, make sure you download Huge Casino from the link in my description box below for free, and you will get 5 million chips when you download. Once you get playing and find out your favorite slot, I want you to come back and tell me your favorite game. Once again, make sure you use the link in the description box below to download Huge Casino for free and you will get 5 million chips when you download. Thank you again so much to Huge Casino for partnering with me on today's video. With all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we will be discussing the case of Reagan Tokes. Reagan Tokes was born on March 13, 1995 in Edgewood, Kentucky to parents Toby and Lisa Tokes, and she had a sister named Mackenzie and a beloved Shih Tzu dog named Ellie. Reagan was described as being a vibrant, bubbly, compassionate young woman with a passion for life. She loved animals, she loved being outside in nature, and most of all, she loved spending time with her family, who she absolutely loved and cherished. She was raised as a Christian, using those ideologies to guide her path in life, allowing her to put her focus towards caring for others. She spent years going on missions with her church, helping the less fortunate. While attending Anthony Wade High School, she played on the lacrosse team as well as varsity tennis all four years. In addition to being very athletic, Reagan was also very intelligent. She graduated from high school with honors. In fact, she graduated with a 4.5 GPA. After high school, Reagan went on to attend Ohio State University, the university she had dreamed of attending since she was just a child. Now, Reagan and her family grew up in Ohio, so back in 2003, her father took her to a University of Ohio football game. There, little Reagan told her dad that that is just the school she wanted to go to. Even though her family had just moved from Ohio to Florida right after Reagan's high school graduation, she decided to head back to Ohio to attend school there. When she was accepted into the university, she was so proud to call herself a student there. Reagan started her first year at Ohio State as a pre-med student, but as her family would later put it, organic chemistry kicked her butt. I totally understand chemistry kicked my butt too. 
but because of that, she changed her major to psychology. She knew overall that she loved helping people and wanted to spend her life doing just that. She actually had a job all lined up at the Cleveland Clinic after graduation, hoping to work there for a few years before opening up her own practice. She had a passion for helping others who were suffering from addiction, mental health issues, and psychological turmoil. Even while in college and all the extracurricular she was doing and taking all of these difficult classes, Reagan still made time for her family and friends. She truly loved spending as much time as possible with the people she loved most. Now, while in college, 21-year-old Reagan, who was a senior at the time, lived in an off-campus apartment in Grove, Ohio with four roommates, Jackie, Madison, Kirsten, and Stephanie. The five women were originally assigned together as roommates in the dorms her first year, but as fate would have it, they all got along very well and became very close friends. At the time, Reagan had been dating a boy named Jake, but after some time dating, Reagan and Jake actually came to the mutual decision that it was best that they just focus on their studies, so they did end up breaking up. This wasn't something that Reagan took super well, but at the time, she knew that it was for the best. She was so close to graduating with her father buying her a new frame for her diploma already and her posting on social media about how excited she was to finally be almost done with school. Such an exciting time in a young person's life, almost being done with college, looking forward to what is next when you finally get to start making some real money and enjoying your career that you worked so damn hard hard for. By the evening of Wednesday, February 8th, 2017, Reagan clocked into work for her shift at the bodega restaurant and bar. By 9.45 p.m. that same night, Reagan is seen leaving work on security footage and heading towards her car, which was parked in the street behind the restaurant. Now, this was an area where she and pretty much all the other employees parked their cars. I also want to note that on most nights, Reagan would always have a male coworker walk her to her car, but on this particular night, for whatever reason, she went to her car alone. Reagan was also known as someone to always be in contact with friends and family. Even during her work shift, she had been texting back and forth with her dad. Right before the shift ended, she texted her dad saying that she was going to call him once she got off of work. Then, after the work shifts, she would always make sure to text a family member or a friend that she was done with work and made it home. But on this particular night, Reagan stopped answering her text messages and that call to her father never came. By 10.30 p.m., both her father, Toby, and her sister, Mackenzie, grew concerned at Reagan's lack of communication. It just was not like her to stop responding. So for the following few hours, they both called her several times, but the phone just rang without any answer. Then by 2 a.m., the call started going to voicemail. To her family, it seemed like this meant that her phone had died. Reagan not answering her phone or at least texting her family back was extremely out of character for Reagan and she never turned her phone off. So her family spent the entire night worrying about her, but even then, they didn't want to panic just yet. While they did worry about the worst case scenario, such as her getting into a car accident, they also thought that maybe she just went out with friends and her phone had died. Maybe this was just a big misunderstanding. That following morning on February 9th, Kirsten went to Reagan's bedroom and peeked inside to get Reagan up. The two usually walked to class together, but on this morning, Reagan was not in her room. Her room was still neat and tidy with her bed made up and nothing looking out of the ordinary. She initially thought that maybe Reagan had woken up early and went to the library that morning. After all, midterms were that week, but Kirsten noticed that her backpack was still on the floor. Then she learned that Reagan did not show up to class that morning. At that point, Kirsten and the rest of Reagan's roommates were incredibly worried for her well-being. 
they knew that it just was not like her to skip class, especially on midterms week. So immediately, Reagan's roommates went over to the bodega to see if anyone there knew where she had been, and they confirmed that Reagan showed up to work, she worked her shift, and left in her car that night. But Reagan's manager knew that it was very odd for her not to show back up home and not to show up to classes. So he quickly filed a missing persons report with the local authorities. Columbus Police, Tech 62. Hi. Uh, so we had a uh, employee leave work last night, and she has not been home. Uh, her phone is off. Nobody can find her. So I wanted to see what I could do about filing a report or getting any kind of documentation down. Okay. You you want to? So she left work, and you haven't heard from her, and like she didn't report today. Uh, correct. Um, her mom's been calling, uh, looking for, um, we can't find her car around work. I called, uh, the jail and they said she wasn't in the Franklin County jail, so. Okay. We um, can, um. Just trying to see what my next step we is can do here. A, if you have her address, we can send the police to her house to do a well check on her. Well, actually, her roommates are here. She hasn't been home at all either. Mm. Um, I mean, that would be the next step is a well check unless, I mean. Do you want to make a missing persons report? Uh, yes. Pretty much immediately after this 911 call was made, Columbus police started their investigation. They talked to everyone who knew her, and this is when they learned that so many people had been trying to get into contact with her without success. They knew that for this young, vibrant college student, this behavior was very out of character. At the same time, Reagan's friends all started posting to social media to spread awareness about her disappearance and to ask for anyone who knew anything to come forward with what they knew. Of course, when it comes to missing persons cases like this, the first person that police will look into are the past and current partners of that missing person. For Reagan, police immediately looked into Jake. Like I said, they had just broken up, so maybe there was some animosity there. However, almost immediately, police were able to rule him out. Multiple people vouched for him, including friends of Reagan's, and he did have an alibi for the time that she went missing, so there was no further information that he could offer. However, the searches for Reagan did not last long. By around 1 p.m. on the afternoon of February 9th, 2017, 911 received a call from a man clearly distressed who just discovered the naked body of a young woman lying on the ground near the entrance of Scioto Grove Metro Park. When police arrived, they found the naked body of a young woman lying on the ground, partially covered in snow. At the scene, police were unable to find any form of ID. They couldn't find the wallet and no personal belongings. Not even her clothes were anywhere to be found. Initially, because of this, the body couldn't be identified because, again, there was really no way to identify a random body without the proper identification on them. However, obviously, police knew about the missing persons report, so they did go ahead and spoke with Reagan's roommates about a distinctive tattoo that they found on the woman that they found. And of course, Reagan also did have that tattoo. After a few hours of working to confirm the identity of this young woman, the body was confirmed as belonging to 21-year-old Reagan Tokes. After finding Reagan's body, she was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. This autopsy revealed that Reagan had been raped. She had been murdered by gunshot wounds to the back of her head, which had been shot two times at a medium to close range. One of the bullets entered through the back of her skull, while one entered through the left side of her face, and one of the bullets was found still lodged in her skull. At that point, everybody involved in the case racked their brains to figure out why someone would have done this to Reagan. She was a kind young woman who was loved by everyone who knew her. So how and why did someone do something so brutal and so awful to her? Now, at the same time, police had already been on high alert due to a wave of crime and attacks that were taking place in the 
area in late January to early February of 2017. On January 23rd, a woman was in the garage of her home getting some items out of the trunk of her car when she was attacked from behind by a masked assailant who attempted to rob her. The following day, another woman was outside of her home when she was attacked by a masked assailant who held a knife to her throat and demanded money, only ending up with $3 from the robbery. There was another attack on January 27th with another masked assailant approaching a woman who was walking towards the building she worked in, which was the children's hospital. Once again, this man held a knife to her throat and told the woman not to scream or he would kill her, and then demanded that she hand over her purse. He ended up getting some gift cards from her. By February 1st, a masked assailant now used a gun to threaten a man and rob him, stealing $20 from him. The following day, the masked assailant kidnapped another woman and forced her to drive to an ATM and withdraw money, of course, using a gun to threaten her. This time, he actually got a good chunk of change, getting $500 from her. On February 6th, another woman was outside of her house when a masked man put a gun to her head and demanded her purse. In this situation, however, the man was a lot more violent. He violently snatched her purse from her and shoved the woman to the ground and pistol whipped her on her face. The assailant got... $38 from her for all this trouble. On February 7th, a woman was outside of the children's hospital again where she worked and she was robbed with a firearm as well. This time, the man took her purse as well as whatever was inside. So he might have gotten a little bit more money from this one, but we don't exactly know how much. Then, as we know, the day following that attack, Reagan was raped, kidnapped, and murdered on February 8th. Unfortunately, at this time, police still hadn't been able to identify who this masked man was. In the meantime, police continued their investigation. Using license plate readers, police were able to locate Reagan's car. It was parked in a nearby residential neighborhood. When looking inside the car, there was evidence that whoever was last inside the car had attempted to burn it. There was a gasoline canister, as well as cinch marks on the seat. In addition to that, police found several ATM receipts from the night that Reagan went missing. Most of those receipts were from failed ATM withdrawals, with the exception of one, which was a withdrawal for $60. They also found cigarette butts in the car, which did give police some hope, because that meant that they might be able to use DNA to make a connection to Reagan's killer. This also sort of confirmed that the person responsible for the string of assaults and robberies are probably connected to what happened to Reagan because, again, Reagan had been kidnapped in her car and forced to make ATM withdrawals, very similar to what happened to a couple of those other victims. Only a few days after submitting those cigarette butts for DNA, they actually got the results back. It was a very quick turnaround relative to what you normally see, so this was such a relieving break in the case. The reason that the DNA came back so quickly was because it actually matched someone who was already in their system. This DNA belonged to 29-year-old Brian Goldsby. Brian Goldsby was very well known by police in the area because he had a very long, extensive criminal history. In fact, he had been in prison for less than six years before he was released just before Reagan's death in November of 2016. According to Brian's juvenile records, he had a history of theft, criminal trespass, and receiving stolen property. But that's not the worst of it. He was also charged with threatening his own mother with a knife. Then, when he was a teenager, he had been convicted of raping five- and six-year-old children. When he was an adult, he kidnapped a woman who was eight months pregnant as well as her two-year-old son. In that situation, he forced the woman to drive to an ATM and withdraw money. Then he forced her to drive to her apartment where they went inside and he raped her in front of her two-year-old child. Then he forced her to shower and brush her teeth so that his DNA wouldn't be on her. After this, the woman reported the incident and there was enough evidence to confirm what happened. So, Brian was charged with two counts of armed robbery and rape. 
However, the victim in this case was absolutely terrified and could not face him to testify. As a result, he accepted a plea deal. He ended up pleading guilty just to armed robbery and attempted rape. For this, he was given a sentence of six years. At the time, he was listed as a tier three sex offender with high risk of reoffending. While in prison, it was stated that he committed 52 infractions, including possession of contraband, theft, and creating a disturbance. Despite this, he was released early from his six-year sentence. Because he was assessed to be a high-risk offender, he was required to wear an ankle monitor with a GPS monitoring system, and he had to report with his probation officer on a regular basis. After his release, he stayed in a halfway house with other offenders. And of course, while he was out, his probation officer did a shitty job of actually monitoring Brian's activities. With Brian's GPS ankle monitor, it had the ability to notify the parent company that owned the GPS operating system, and they were supposed to notify the parole officers of any probation or curfew violations. So, if he went anywhere outside of his allotted area, or if he broke curfew, his probation officer should be notified. However, nobody kept track of this data, nor did they inform the parole board of his multiple, 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 multiple probation violations. From early December to late January, he had multiple violations that included being out past curfew, not keeping his ankle monitor charged, and not reporting to his parole officer on time. He committed a total of three violations within those first two months. Then, if you haven't made the connection by now, Brian was also the one responsible for all of those attacks that we just discussed from late January to early February. Within a week, he committed more than seven felonies, mostly all against women. He beat and robbed several women, threatening them with knives, and then somehow he obtained a gun during that time. Once he illegally obtained a firearm, he then used that to beat and threaten women. All of these incidents were recorded on his ankle monitor, but none of it was reported. It was only after Reagan's murder and his DNA being in her car that anyone looked at that GPS data from his ankle monitor, and it confirmed that he was responsible for all of those attacks because, again, he was in the exact place at the exact time that all of these incidences were taking place. That is not a coincidence. Using this, police scoured the area around where Reagan was taken to see if they could find any surveillance video that connected Brian to the the abduction. They found security video from a nearby convenience store, which showed Brian purchasing a gas container that matched the one that was found in Reagan's car. They also found security video from the ATMs that had been used to attempt those withdrawals. By 1.02 p.m. on February 8th, CCTV footage at a Chase bank captures Reagan attempting to take out $500, but it was declined. At 10.14 p.m., a Huntington Bank ATM video showed Reagan attempting to take out money again, but again, it didn't go through. Between 10.18 and 10.30 p.m., security video from a nearby building captured Reagan and Brian stopped in an alley, and it is believed that this may be where Brian raped Reagan. After that, video captures Reagan returning back to that original Chase ATM where she withdrew $60. After that, security video captured both Reagan and Brian at the gas station where he purchased gas. Then, sometime between midnight and 1 a.m., they drove to Sayoto Grove Metro Park, and that is where Reagan was forced to strip down and walk into the field, crying and terrified for her life before she was shot in the back of her head. Additionally, the medical examiner had performed a rape kit on Reagan, and that also came back as a match to Brian's DNA. Using all of this information, by February 11th, 2017, a SWAT team raided Brian's house, and they arrested him. We're gonna double check for safety. You're gonna search the lot, all right? Mm. Got on you real quick.
After taking him into the station, they conducted a six-hour-long interview. Initially, Brian denied having anything to do with Reagan's murder. He did, however, admit to robbing her. In the interview, he admitted that after Reagan left the bar, he confronted her outside of her work, got into her car, and then forced her to drive to different ATMs in the area so that he could rob her. He said that he drove her to an isolated area down the road and forced her to strip down. He said that he told her to wait 30 minutes before she left so that he could get away. He took her clothes with him in the car and drove off, ditching her car in a nearby residential area where it was later found. He swore up and down that she was still alive when he left her there. However, after being confronted with the DNA evidence and the fact that she was shot in the back of the head, Brian changed his story. He was now saying that he was there when she was shot, but he wasn't the one who shot her. He said that he was with someone named TJ. TJ was someone that Brian apparently owed money to, so they both went out and planned on robbing Reagan so that TJ could get his money back. Brian said that he thought that they were only supposed to rob her, but all of a sudden, TJ forced Brian to rape Reagan. He said that at that point, all he wanted to do was run away and get himself out of the situation, but he was afraid for himself and his children and his family, so he complied with TJ's demands to rape Reagan. After that, TJ drove them to the area of Scioto Grove Park and forced Reagan to strip down. Then he described that TJ shot her in the back of the head and she fell to the ground. Then TJ stood over her and shot her in the head again. He then admitted to going and buying gas with TJ so that they could set her car on fire and get rid of the evidence. <laughs> Then, Brian actually told officers where Reagan's clothes, her phone and wallet, as well as the gun that was used to kill her were all hidden. The gun turned out to be a revolver, and it was later found in a sewer in a residential area. Then he admitted that he kept Reagan's black Kate Spade purse, as well as her wallet, which he then gave to his girlfriend as a Valentine's Day gift. Clearly, Brian had enough information to tell the police that he was definitely present for her murder. There was no question about that. He had the guilt knowledge and he was very descriptive in his story. However, he was not able to give a lick of information about TJ. He didn't even know what he looked like. He didn't know what his last name was. He didn't know where he could be located. None of that. So, Based on the information that we've discussed up to this point, police did know that Brian was responsible for all of this, so he was charged with aggravated robbery, aggravated rape, and aggravated murder. To this, he continued to plead not guilty, even though he pretty much admitted to everything that happened that night. While awaiting his trial in jail, Brian was actually visited by a few different people. One was a woman who actually had a six-year-old daughter with Brian. According to her, when she visited Brian, she straight up asked him if he raped and killed Reagan, and he admitted it. He said that he did. Of course, this woman was horrified, saying that she immediately dropped the prison phone and left. She then later returned to visit Brian again a few months later, and this time she asked him why he did it and he said that he needed the money. He said that he did it because of his daughter, and he couldn't have anything bad happen to her. As if raping someone is at all necessary when you're robbing someone for money to provide for your children. And, 
all he got for that was $60 for her. Yeah, that's going to change his daughter's life. Then a close friend of Brian's who referred to him almost as a brother also visited Brian in jail to get some answers. Once again, he admitted to her that he did rape and kill Reagan. By February 13th, 2017, Brian had his first court appearance where he was denied bond and made to await his trial in jail. While awaiting the trial in jail, time did not stop or slow down for Reagan's family. The date for Reagan's graduation came in May of 2017, and it was a joyous yet somber occasion. That day, almost 12,000 OSU students accepted their diplomas, but there was still a big gaping hole where Reagan should have been. Her parents and sister stood at the stadium and accepted Reagan's bachelor degree on her behalf, reminding students of the legacy that she would be leaving behind. We would like to take a moment to remember two of our fellow Buckeyes. But the story of Ohio State senior Reagan Tokes will have to be told by her parents. She was kidnapped and killed while leaving her job at Bodega in February, just months before she was to graduate. But today her family got to see her hard work at Ohio State pay off. Reagan Delaney Tokes to receive the degree Bachelor of Arts. The Tokes family, while battling their emotions, received Reagan's posthumous degree on her behalf and released this statement soon after, which reads in part, Reagan Delaney Tokes wanted to be a Buckeye ever since she was a little girl. Today, her dream became a reality as she was awarded a diploma from the Ohio State University. As her parents and family, we are so proud of her and her accomplishments. It is heartbreaking that she was not able to accept the diploma herself, but we are so grateful to the university for presenting it to us to accept for her. Just over a year later after the murder, by March 5th, 2018, Brian's trial for murder started. The prosecution argued that Brian Goldsby was a convicted criminal and a registered sex offender with an extensive history of sexual violence against women. They talked extensively about the DNA evidence that they found throughout this case that we have been discussing up to this point. The cigarette butts that were found in the car, the rape kit. His DNA was all over her car, proving that he was with her at some point and that he did, in fact, rape her. It was also found that Reagan's DNA was on the barrel of the gun that was used in the murder. The prosecution also talked about his GPS ankle monitor, which literally tracked him along the same route that Reagan and her car were seen taking on the night of the murder. The GPS monitor was also able to track how fast he was going at any given time, so they were able to tell whether he was walking or if he was in a vehicle. Like I mentioned earlier, he admitted to kidnapping Reagan on the night of the murder. According to his GPS monitor, he was walking around OSU's campus at around 7.30 p.m. the same day. He then took a bus and headed downtown. By 8.09 p.m., he is tracked walking in circles around the area of the bodega where Reagan worked. He meandered around the area for about an hour after that. By 9.42 p.m., that is around the same time that Reagan was known to have been kidnapped. His GPS monitor then tracked him to that Chase Bank, the Huntington Bank, where Reagan was seen on surveillance. The GPS also tracked him to that alley where they stayed for 12 minutes. Again, this was also captured on surveillance video of Reagan being in her car parked in that alley for 12 minutes. Again, it is thought that this is where she was raped. After that, his GPS tracked him to the same gas stations that we discussed earlier, then to Sayoto Grove Metro Park, where Reagan's body was later found. What the GPS and surveillance also confirmed was that there was nobody else with them at this time. It was just Reagan and Brian, no TJ or some other accomplice that was forcing Brian to do crazy things. His GPS also confirmed that he did go to his girlfriend's place where he gave her Reagan's purse and wallet as a gift. 
Then, the day after the murder, the GPS also tracked Brian to the area where Reagan's car was dumped in that residential area. So, pretty much, he was traced everywhere that Reagan was. He was traced to every single location that was connected to her murder. So, of course, he was there every step of the way he was the one who murdered her according to his own GPS ankle monitor. Then, like I said earlier, there were two women who say that Brian admitted to the rape and murder while he was in jail. Now, these two women testified at trial and talked about everything they knew. They said that neither of them had a car to drive, but on the night of February 8th, they saw Brian driving in a car that they had never seen before. Turns out, of course, it was Reagan's car. By February 10th, Brian showed both women the car and they both said that the car smelled like gasoline, which obviously they thought was odd. He told these women that he had just purchased the car from a man named TJ, which was someone neither women had heard of before him mentioning that he bought the car from them. Of course, this just confirmed even further that Brian had Reagan's car after she was murdered and tried to set it on fire with gasoline. Of course, both of these women said that once they realized that Brian was on the news and heard what he was being accused of, they were terrified. They felt that what happened to Reagan could have happened to either one of them. That is why they came forward with their stories. Then, as we know, Brian pretty much confessed to Reagan's murder. Obviously, he was saying that TJ was responsible for it, but he had enough guilt knowledge. He was clearly there for it. There was clearly nobody else with him, so he pretty much admitted that he was the one who murdered Reagan. The prosecution said that Reagan went along with what Brian was demanding of her that night because all she wanted to do was live. She begged for her life. But instead, Brian forced her to endure two hours of absolute torture and horror, ending her life at the end of it so that she could not report him for his crimes. On the other hand, the defense basically said that Brian deserves the presumption of innocence, as does any citizen. They said that the DNA on Reagan does not prove when he was with her. It also doesn't prove that he was the one who raped her on that particular night. He could have raped her another night. No big deal. It also doesn't prove that he was in her car on that particular night just that he was with her at some point. Again, the DNA being in the car doesn't say he was with her on this night, just that he had been there at some point. But of course, the defense knew that the prosecution did have a very rock-solid case, and maybe if all they had was the DNA, they could make this argument more solid, but they also had that GPS data from the ankle monitor as well as from the surveillance video that showed that he was with her on that particular night. Because of this, the defense also wanted to make the jury feel empathy for Brian. They talked about how he had a very rough upbringing, he had a very low IQ of 76, bordering on being intellectually disabled, he said that he was raped at a very young age, and he suffered from severe major depressive disorder with several suicide attempts as he was growing up. Throughout his entire childhood, he was abused and neglected by his family, and all of this led him into using cocaine, which had even more of a negative impact on his behaviors and his mental health. Basically, they wanted to make it clear that Brian wasn't some psychopath, deranged, calculated, cold criminal. He was abused, unintelligent, and just needed money, and things just went too far. They were basically just trying to argue this so that the jury wouldn't sentence him to death. Instead, they asked for life in prison. They said that if Brian was a smart and calculated killer, he wouldn't have worn his GPS monitor. Not only that, but he charged the GPS to make sure it wouldn't die. That is about the stupidest thing that you can do if you're going to murder someone. But the prosecution said that none of that mattered. Brian was still a murderer. What he did to Reagan was horrific, and he deserved the worst possible punishment for this. At the end of the trial, which lasted just over a week, the jury was sent off for deliberations. They deliberated for about five and a half hours before they came back with their verdict. They found that Brian Goldsby was guilty on all counts, including kidnapping, rape, and murder. 
For this, he was actually spared the death penalty. Instead, he was handed a life sentence without the possibility of parole. <laughs> Um, All right, the verdict forms appear to be in order. The court will publish and read the verdicts. Verdict, we the jury in this case being duly impaneled and sworn, find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt as to count one in the indictment for aggravated murder. Count two, we the jury find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of kidnapping. They further find beyond a reasonable doubt he did brandish, display, or utilize a firearm in the commission of the offense. Count three, aggravated murder, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. All the verdict forms are signed. Counsel may approach and review the verdict forms to make sure they're in order. Both sides can approach to review the verdict forms. The verdict's the same on all counts. We, the jury, being deadlocked and unable to agree on whether the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating factors beyond a reasonable doubt, hereby unanimously determine the following life sentence on count one, life imprisonment without parole, signed by all 12 jurors. Same with regard to count three. Do I need to read the verdict? No. No, you same with count uh, five and the same with count seven, signed by all 12 jurors with the parties. The lawyers like to review the verdict forms. Yes, At his sentencing hearing, the judge emphasized that he is happy that Brian will die in jail, saying that Reagan did nothing wrong to deserve what Brian did to her. He said, quote, you need to understand she did nothing wrong. Your life got spared because at least four members of the jury, maybe less, maybe more, something in that neighborhood, felt that your upbringing were mitigating, so your life got spared because of your childhood. Yet Reagan did nothing wrong whatsoever, and yet she forfeited her life because of your background. You get spared because of your background, and yet she forfeited her life. She did nothing wrong except be at work. After his initial sentencing, the prosecution on the case actually filed a 53-page motion asking for the death penalty to be reconsidered on this case. The prosecution argued that it was because of a legal error that the jury felt that Brian's past was enough to say that he didn't deserve the death penalty. They said that the jury were told that the defense had no burden of proof when presenting mitigating factors. This meant that the defense could basically make things up about Brian's past that may or may not have actually happened. The prosecutors used Brian's alleged rape as an example. They said that in his stories telling about the rape, he would sometimes say he was 10, other times he would say he was 12, and another time he said he was 13 when it took place. The location of the alleged rape were also inconsistent, with him sometimes saying that it happened in a store, sometimes it happened behind a store, sometimes it happened on the street. They said that the jury couldn't have considered that these stories could have been made up, meaning that they fully believed that he was raped and that that was enough to be a mitigating factor. This case was argued in front of multiple courts, but it ended up being denied. They said that they felt that the jury was given proper instruction. This decision was appealed by prosecutors saying that Brian is a cold-blooded, remorseless killer who got a lesser sentence because of things that may have never actually happened. At this point, the case has not made it to the Supreme Court, but I believe they are planning to take it as far as the case will go. Of course, after all of this, Reagan's family were also furious at the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, as well as the parent company that oversees the exit program that housed Brian. In May of 2018, they actually filed a lawsuit that claims both entities were negligent and failed to adequately monitor Brian, which led directly to Reagan's murder. And I have to say, I do agree. He was committing crime after crime after crime for days leading up to her murder. People were scared of this masked bandit going around hurting and robbing women with police saying that they just couldn't figure out who it was. Yet the person responsible was literally wearing an ankle monitor that was supposed to be tracked by law enforcement. Their case against the Ohio State Corrections unfortunately was denied. 
They did take it all the way to the Supreme Court where they refused to hear the case, but they were able to settle the case against the NISRE, which was the parent company of the exit program. But despite being denied from their first lawsuit, Reagan's family refused to give up. They worked with Congress to pass the reagan Tokes Act, which was signed into Ohio law in December of 2018. This law requires judges to enact a minimum term for Class 1 and Class 2 felonies. These offenders are presumed to be released at their minimum term. However, before being released, their case must go in front of the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, where they will hold an administrative meeting. There, they will review if the offender has engaged in improper conduct and determine whether they will be a threat to society. If so, they must continue to their maximum sentence. If they show exceptional conduct during their sentence, they may be allowed to reduce an offender's sentence by 5 to 15 percent of the minimum sentence. This is in hopes that the most violent offenders will stay behind bars as long as humanly possible, while allowing those who truly have proven themselves to be better may be in prison for a shorter period of time. Hopefully, this will serve as a way to protect Ohio from the most dangerous criminals, while also allowing those with lesser charges and less serious offenses to be released early and make more room for the dangerous criminals. Rather than releasing the violent violent offenders who continue to prove themselves as being dangerous and clearly aren't going to change any of their behaviors. So that is actually all I have for today's case. This is one of those cases that leaves me just feeling kind of awful. It's so disappointing to see cases where people are just let out of prison, especially early, despite showing obvious behaviors that they will not stop committing crimes. Then, when they are released, the people responsible for monitoring them don't do their jobs. Instead, they just trust that this violent offender who is labeled as high risk of reoffending will just stop committing crimes even though they literally continued committing crimes while in prison being watched by people very closely. Imagine what can happen when they're not being watched very closely. This is what happens. Again, this case also highlights the patterns of behavior where someone will commit a violent crime brutally rape someone and then when they're released, they just do it again, but this time they want to get rid of the witness so that they won't be connected to the rape. All this does with putting these offenders behind bars and then letting them out after raping someone, all it does is teach them that now they just need to get rid of the victim so that they can't report them. That is all this does of letting people out early after they raped somebody. We see this so often where someone will rape someone or violently sexually assault them or whatever and then they go to jail for it and then as soon as they're released, they do the same thing but this time they just kill the person to get rid of the witness. That happens so often and the fact that it continues to happen is absurd. It's also absolutely absurd and terrifying that he was literally being tracked while committing a string of violent crimes and yet nobody thought, hey, Maybe one of the people that was just released from prison who is wearing an ankle monitor, why don't we check that really quick to see if he could be involved? Instead, investigators just scratched their behinds and said, we have no idea who's doing this. I guess we'll just have to catch him in the act. I actually don't know how they plan to catch him, but he did it seven times while wearing an ankle monitor. It doesn't get any more simple than that. Someone is literally being tracked as they're committing these crimes. That data is being reported to an entity that is supposed to keep track of them. If you can't even keep track of that, what can you do? As you can see, this case really does get to me because I do think that the lack of accountability, the lack of responsibility on the part of the parole board and the people involved in keeping track of his whereabouts, that led directly to Reagan's murder. And I think that the more Brian did with his ankle monitor, the more he realized that nobody was actually watching him, so that's what allowed him to continue doing what he was doing. I feel so very heartbroken for Reagan's family and everybody else who loved her. Reagan had so much life ahead of her to live before it was just brutally and horrifically ripped away from her for absolutely no reason. It's devastating, it's heartbreaking, and it was absolutely preventable. It's just horrific. But that is where I'm going to end today's video, and now I want to hear what you all think. 
Do you think that Brian could have been stopped if the GPS ankle monitor was being tracked? What do you think of the lawsuit and the fact that the Supreme Court would not hear it? What do you think of Brian's sentence? Do you think he should have gotten death? Let me know any and all thoughts that you have on this case in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Make sure you go ahead and turn those notifications to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Also, make sure you use the link down below to download Huge Casino for free and you will get 5 million chips when you download. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.